Institute's special Remote Witness Preparation podcast series focuses on methods you can use to help your witnesses better prepare to appear in a remote environment. Today's episode features litigation attorney Dan Small discussing both remote preparing and the rules for the remote deposition itself. He reminds us that the parties and the witnesses should not ease up on the normal rules for depositions just because everyone is not in the same physical room. As the federal court stated in Hall v. Clifton, depositions are the factual battleground where the vast majority of litigation actually takes place. But what if that battleground is in cyberspace because the deposition is done remotely? The COVID crisis has turned an occasional oddity of needing to provide remote testimony into the new norm where everything is done in front of the camera in real time. Remote depositions now involve people in different rooms, different states, different time zones, even different countries. Counsel has to prepare themselves and their witnesses for the very different feel and features of this new process. First and foremost is the decision to go remote. In many cases, counsel will not have a choice. That decision has been made by the court or other ruling authority. But we've seen regulatory commissions holding remote hearings and testimony. However, in cases where there may be a choice to either go remote or put off the deposition until it can be done live, counsel needs to carefully consider the advantages and disadvantages of both scenarios including the following. First, costs. A remote deposition may actually be significantly less expensive than a live one, particularly if there are travel or other expenses that would be incurred for live testimony. Documents. In a document-heavy deposition, doing it remotely takes significantly more preparation and coordination. In a live deposition, you can get away with thumbing through your files for a document you may not have anticipated needing to show it to the witness. It can be much more difficult doing that remotely. As I mentioned in the first podcast of this series, I highly recommend creating a well-organized document binder for both you and the client to easily reference if you plan to use documents for remote depositions or other online testimony. Quality. There's no question that in many in-person depositions, the questioner can pick up nonverbal cues to figure out how and where to push the witness for better testimony. Moreover, the intensity and focus of the live event can lead to better testimony on both sides. In an online environment, it's not as easy to pick up on those cues and use them to interpret the responses from the witness. Confrontation. In depositions where it may be important to confront the witness, either with tough questions or with documents and transcripts, there's little doubt that face-to-face is more effective. On the other hand, if you are representing the witness, there may be advantages to avoiding the added intimidation of a face-to-face confrontation with opposing counsel. If you know there will be contentious issues and you're required to use remote testimony, spend extra time preparing your witness and have them practice responding to tough questions on camera, including teaching them how and when to indicate if they may need help or guidance from counsel. Credibility. There are times when the witness has to tell or explain a difficult story, and the added credibility from looking people in the eye may be of value. So the delay to wait for a live room or courtroom may be advantageous. Once the decision for a remote deposition is made, counsel needs to to prepare the witness for the process. The parties and the witness should not ease up on the normal rules for depositions just because everyone is not in the same room. But it can make recognizing and enforcing those rules more challenging. For example, the Illinois Supreme Court recently issued an order amending its Rule 206 requirements for remote depositions. The committee comment to the rule addresses several key logistical issues, including attendees. In a live deposition, everyone in the room knows who's who and who's where. The committee notes that since in a remote deposition, opposing counsel is not in the room to see what's going on, quote, the testifying deponent may be examined regarding the identity of all persons in the room during the testimony. 
The comment goes on to say that, quote, where possible, all persons in the room during the testimony should separately participate in the video conference. In other words, if you're there, you should be on camera so there isn't hidden misconduct. Questioning counsel should ask each witness, and each witness should be prepared to answer who else is in the room and who else they're communicating with in any fashion. Communication. If the deposition is not live, it may be tempting for counsel or others to try to communicate with a witness in ways they might not with everyone watching. The committee comment states that, quote, counsel representing a deponent should instruct the deponent that he or she may not communicate with anyone during the examination other than the examining attorney or the court reporter. Cheat sheets. Again, without opposing counsel or others in the room, the witness or their counsel might be tempted to seek written guidance or written input. The committee notes say that counsel for the witness should instruct that, quote, he or she may not consult any written, printed, or electronic information during the examination other than information provided by the examining attorney. I would expect many other jurisdictions to offer similar guidance, so be sure to stay current on your particular court's guidelines. Next, consider language issues. Like many aspects of communication, language issues may be greatly aggravated by the remote setting. If people are talking over one another, if there's a significant sound delay, or if the words just don't seem clear, counsel may want to stop and have it repeated or ask the court reporter to read it back and then do whatever else he or she needs to make it clear. If there is an interpreter, interpreting is also much harder remotely and adds considerable time to the process. Make sure there's someone on your team who speaks both languages and can confirm in real time that the interpreter is getting it right. Stop and interrupt if you're not sure or if a correction or clarification needs to be made. Finally, in a remote deposition, the errata sheet becomes even more important to give counsel and the witness one last opportunity to make sure that what goes into the record is really what was said on camera. Finally, consider the challenges of communicating within your team. My Holland and Knight colleague, Tara Koshik, recently wrote a great blog about her experience conducting a remote evidentiary hearing, and much of it is equally applicable to a deposition. On this issue, she advised, and I quote, strategize in advance how you can confer offline with your client, your witness, or co-party's counsel in sidebar conferences during the hearing. You may want to make sure that you have more than one phone in the room for texting or calling as needed, or a separate laptop with a separate video conference set up for strategy meetings during breaks. Many cases these days are won or lost at the deposition stage. Doing a deposition remotely presents new challenges to an already difficult environment for witnesses and counsel. Work with your witness to anticipate and prepare for those challenges. Thank you for listening to Holland and Knight's special remote witness preparation podcast series featuring Dan Small, a litigation partner who focuses on internal and external investigations, witness preparation, and white collar criminal matters. His popular CLE programs on witness preparation and other litigation topics can be arranged through the professional education group at proedgroup.com. He's the author of the ABA's Manual on Preparing Witnesses, and he also welcomes input on this and other podcast programs at dan.small at hklaw.com.